Welcome to a new episode of Retrace in History here on Readout Productions, and I'm excited to be here at Monocacy National Battlefield, just south of Frederick, Maryland. We're about an hour north of Washington, D.C., and well, on this site, there was a battle from the American Civil War occurring in July of 1864, and many people were surprised to discover that the Battle of Gettysburg was not the only Confederate invasion of the North during the war. Many called the high water mark of the Confederacy. Well, the Confederacy is actually going to get closer to attacking Washington, D.C. here at Monocacy than they did at Gettysburg. This is a small, often overlooked, but vital component to understanding the course of the American Civil War. Let's go explore these hallowed fields and dive into how the Confederate Army, commanded by Jubal Early, and the Union Army, commanded by Lew Wallace, are going to fight here. Oh, we're back in the studio. Don't worry, don't worry. We're going to go back to the battlefield. But first, I want to kind of explain how we get to the Monocacy battlefield. What is happening in 1864 during the American Civil War? Because this is really an unexplored element of the conflict. You always hear about Gettysburg being the turning point and completely ignoring Vicksburg in 1863. And then sometimes we kind of just leapfrog right to the end. They know, oh, it's inevitable. The Confederacy is going to lose. Well, in 1864, everything is still up in the air. What is going on is in the spring of 1864, Ulysses says, Grant, uh, the Union Army's leading commander, comes to the Eastern Theater to finally break the nut that is the Army of Northern Virginia for the Confederacy, commanded by Robert E. Lee. And throughout the spring and early summer, in Northern Virginia, Grant and Lee fight a series of bloody engagements, what is known collectively as the Overland Campaign. And while Grant is successful in driving Lee into trenches around the vital rail hub of Petersburg, Virginia, he has not defeated the Army of Northern Virginia yet. They are still hanging on, desperately, but still hanging on. And the blood losses incurred during this Overland Campaign as well as William Tecumseh Sherman's Union offensive into Georgia, is going to make some people in the Union doubt the Lincoln administration and open to an alternative platform. Because guess what? It's 1864 and it's an election year in the United States of America. Yeah, we don't stop presidential elections in times of crisis. We keep to our U.S. Constitution. So what's going to happen is... There's going to be this movement growing. You kind of sometimes are called peace Democrats or just Republicans completely dejected by the war effort that are growing against Lincoln. And there is a realistic threat that when we go to the polls at the end of the year, Lincoln is going to lose the election and be out of office. And this may lead to a peace term with the Confederacy, some vestige of the Confederacy surviving as independent. What do you want, Lily? I'm recording. Well, if you want to be the star, you can go knock Fred off of the podium over there. But you don't want to do that. Okay, we're going to... Well, you got yourself stuck. Jesus. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks, Fred. Oh, wow. The Confederacy wants to exploit this divide in Union politics, and they feel the best way to do that is by detaching a portion of the army in Northern Virginia and send it back north. Now, by 1864, this had kind of been a repetition that had been happening throughout the Civil War. Uh, Lee invaded the North in 1862 and in 1863. Both times not going so well, ending at Antietam and Gettysburg, respectfully. Now, this is a much more lean invasion of the north instead of having the entire army we're looking at about fifteen thousand men predominantly from the second corps of the army of north virginia commanded by now lieutenant general jubal early and he is going to be first sent to lynchburg virginia at the base of the shenandoah valley to reinforce a small con confederate division commanded by john c breckenridge who's been trying to hold the valley the breadbacks of the confederacy from union incursions well in mid-june of 1864 
early is going to assist Breckenridge in stopping a Union attack on Lynchburg. And then for the rest of the month, uh, this Army of the Valley District, as it becomes to be known, is going to roll itself down the Shenandoah Valley. It's actually going to see the burnt vestiges of the Virginia Military Institute, which is going to greatly upset the Confederate soldiers who now want to seek some ounce of revenge for the destruction of what they see as sacred property. They're then going to move out of the Shenandoah Valley, outmaneuvering the Union garrison at Harper's Ferry, and cross South Mountain, and by early July, they are in Maryland. They are within a few days' march of threatening the Union capital of Washington, D.C. This is impressive. This is unprecedented. How did this How did this change events happen so quickly? Why would the Union allow it? Well, uh, the Union did not believe any of the reports they were getting. Uh, they did not believe that the Confederacy had the capacity to go on the offensive again, at least in Northern Virginia. They felt that Grant had mauled Lee so badly in the Overland campaign that they could not take another offensive. Well, they had greatly underestimated the Confederacy. And now we have a sizable Confederate force bearing down on the nation's capital. They're far closer than what Lee had gotten to the two years prior when he invaded the North. And the only reason the Union officials in D.C. start taking this threat seriously is because of the president of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad personally visiting the military headquarters in Baltimore, Maryland. He's going to go into the office of Major General Lou Wallace, who's in charge of Union defenses and what they call the middle department. Really, it's uh, Eastern Maryland going over into New Jersey, even a few little parts of Pennsylvania and Delaware. And he's going to go a, a piece to Wallace that, hey, my property is being destroyed by a whole Confederate army. This isn't some stray raiders like Mosby's raiders coming out of the West Virginia mountains. This is a contingent of the army in North Virginia are you guys going to do something about it? Because I really can't do much about it. I'm a railroad man. You know, I, I run trains. I, I don't fight battles. I transport the troops to battles. And I'm happy to transport you to a battle, Mr. Wallace. But, you know, can you do the fighting for me? So Wallace is in a predicament. He does believe uh, the president's word directly. But the westernmost boundary of his jurisdiction I can operate in is the Monocacy River, just south of Frederick, Maryland, which really won't allow him to get into reach of early immediately. And the other problem is that the department he commands, well, it's greatly under strength. Uh, in total, he's going to pull about 3,000 soldiers together to go and fortify the Monocacy River. And most of these guys in 1864 what we call 100 Days men. Uh, they quite literally enlisted for a very brief service of 100 days. Uh, this was done to relieve the garrison units that were around D.C. and other cities in Maryland to go to the front lines down around uh, northern Virginia. So... Washington, D.C.'s defenses are greatly deprived at this stage in the conflict because they're not expecting such a counteroffensive from the Confederacy. So Wallace is greatly undermanned, has a lack of experience amongst his troops, but he does have one advantage. He can dictate the battlefield. And the Monocacy River near Frederick, Maryland, had been fortified in some capacity the previous year. In fact, there were two blockhouses, one on either side of an iron railroad bridge that carried the Baltimore and Ohio from Washington, D.C. across the Monocacy going west, where it would go right into a junction with a line going north and a line continuing west. Uh, that western line ended up going to Harper's Ferry, by the way. We call this Monocacy Junction. In addition to the rail junction, just a few feet to the west downstream of the Monocacy, you're going to have a turnpike bridge for the Georgetown Pike, carrying this vital road artery from Frederick, Maryland, down to Washington, D.C. There's also upriver up the Monocacy. There is what we call the Jug Bridge, which carries the National Road out of Frederick, Maryland, heading east to Baltimore, Maryland. And it's actually going to be the National Road that Wallace is going to use to first get out here to the region, uh, to get out here and start fortifying the Monocacy Riverfront. On July 8th, 1864, Jubal Early's Confederate Army of the Valley District are descending South Mountain. They're beginning to approach the vital crossroad city of Frederick, Maryland. And well, even though Early's had all this great success thus far, he's not too enthused because Richmond, Virginia keeps emburdening him with more and more loftier objectives that are becoming increasingly unrealistic. First, he was sent 
to detach from the Petersburg line and repossess the Shenandoah Valley. That was a risky move in itself, but the Union didn't catch on to what was happening, so it worked. Now, as he approaches Washington, D.C., which no Confederate force has realistically gotten to yet in this war, it's terribly long distance, now he's given another objective. He is asked if he can go and detach a portion of his army to go east to Baltimore and eventually run down the peninsula of the Chesapeake and Potomac to liberate the Confederate prisoners inside Point Lookout Prison. <laughs> You're not doing that. <laughs> Just no. Uh, early then, and historians today all universally agree that this is a bridge too far. But orders are orders. So as early approaches Frederick, he has the very real difficulty of having to achieve attacking Washington, D.C., or at least threatening it to demoralize the Union, and also send a detachment off to the east to go to Point Lookout. So he's, he's starting to break apart his... Although it's 15,000 men, it is still a small fighting force compared to the armies we normally talk about in the American Civil War. And when it gets to Frederick, that is where the divide will occur, going east across the Jug Bridge and going south across the Covered Bridge for the Georgetown Pike down by Monocacy Junction. At the same time that uh, Earl is dealing with all these lofty objectives and trying to fulfill them, uh, Wallace is going to get a sigh of relief, and that is in the form of a full division from the Union Six Corps. Uh, these are under command of General Ricketts. They're going to come right out of the trenches of Petersburg. They're shipped up by boat up to Baltimore and race down on the, July 8th to reinforce Wallace's position. So Wallace has almost doubled his small defensive force. That's about 6,000 troops he now commands on the south side of Monocacy River. He's still greatly outnumbered compared to the confederates but there's nothing else to do wallace is going to try to make the best defense that he can he knows he cannot win a battle against early but what he can do is buy time for more union reinforcements to be sent to washington dc from northern virginia now let's go back to the battlefield and see how long wallace could hold out against jubal early All right, so it's around 8 o'clock in the morning on July 9th, 1864. And imagine that you are a Confederate soldier in Major General Stephen Ramsher's division of this Army of the Valley that General Early's put together. All right, you've marched hundreds of miles from Petersburg to go over, come down the Shenandoah Valley, cross the Potomac into Maryland, and in your mind, you're one day away from doing what nobody thought the Confederacy could do, attack the Union capital of Washington, D.C. All you gotta do is make about a, I'd say about a 50 mile march from Frederick down to Washington, D.C. You're just leaving Frederick, sun's coming up, it's gonna be a very hot day, and you start encountering Union resistance, which you're anticipating, after all, you are very close to the capital. But you've been told it's just 100 days, men, that these are, you know, these are just soldiers. They're only here to fill the garrisons and make it look like there's some sort of defense to make the Union politicians happy. Well, you're surprised to find that these 100 days, men, are giving you quite the stiff resistance. And as you emerge onto what I'm standing on right now, the best farm just south of Frederick, Maryland, you're getting close to your objective, the Monocacy Rail Junction. And, well, you're in for quite the sight because, yes, there are 100 days men lined up along the Monocacy River all the way from here at the junction going up to the Jug Bridge east of the city. But in amongst them are skirmishers of the 10th Vermont, of the 9th New York Heavy Artillery, of skirmishers from the Union 6th Corps regular soldiers and they're augmented by seven artillery pieces uh, there is a union battery that's been brought up here of six guns and there is a seven piece a howitzer that's been here for about a year and a half now uh, guarding the union blockhouses on either side of the monocacy river protecting that rail junction so it's not a big contingent of artillery but man when you come over this brow and you're going down toward the junction you're going to be in for some whiplash uh, being fired upon by these skirmishers and concentrated artillery fire. And keep in mind, the Confederates are advancing toward a covered bridge and a railroad bridge. Those are choke points, and there is high ground the Union can defend on the south side of the river. Oh no, it's the return of the Nats! Run! Run! It's Antietam all over again.
So we're standing on the property that was owned by the Best family at the time of the battle on July 9th, 1864. But the Best farm has a storied legacy far surpassing the battle itself. And before we dive into that storied past, just to give you an idea of where we are on the battlefield, over my shoulder is the vestiges of the Georgetown Pike, which Stephen Ramser's division of Confederate troops was advancing down to the south to try to cross the Monocacy Junction on the morning of the attack. Truthfully, the story of this property goes all the way back to the end of the 18th century when the Vicindieri's family, or well, a fragment of it, are going to flee uh, what is now present-day Haiti, which in the 1790s was under a state of rebellion. Uh, the slaves in Haiti were rebelling against their masters. And this is going on at the same time as the French Revolution is occurring in Europe. And France had control over Saint Dominic at this time. So, the Vicindieri's uh, wanting to avoid being killed in this rebellion uh, fled to the United States of America and they actually fragmented as they fled across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, one of the family sects, we'll say, was whose head, oddly enough, was not a man, was a woman, was 16-year-old Victoria Vicindieri's. She and the vestiges of her family are going to acquire property here just south of what will become the city of Frederick back in the late 1790s and her intentions is to continue the plantation uh, that they initially had back in Haiti and over time the Vicindieri's family is going to acquire over 700 acres south of Frederick uh, just keep in mind we're only on a very small piece that uh, initial plantation ran the whole way back to where the Francis Scott Key Mall is now in downtown Frederick Maryland and at the turn of the century, there's 108 people living on this massive farm, 90% of it being enslaved individuals. And they, uh, based on archaeological evidence, the enslaved in, uh, village was actually right over here, kind of in this depression, right on that hilltop there we see all the yellow flowers growing. Uh, back in 2003, archaeologists came out on the Monocacy National Battlefield and found the footprints of several structures and the artifacts cor correlate that that is actually where the enslaved people of the Vicendieri's plantation would have been at. Uh, some people have theorized also because of its location being at the bottom like it, of the swell, that that was intentional by the Vicendieres. It was a defensive strategy in case their slaves rebelled, similar to how the slaves revolted in Haiti and what had made the Vicendieres move all the way across the ocean in the first place. Uh, during the Vicendieres time here, and there are elements of this farmhouse that are actually going back to the late 18th century when Victoria and her family lived here. They called this whole 700 acres La Hermitage. Uh, eventually, by the 1820s, however, they decided to do away with the plantation, uh, selling off the property, and that does include the enslaved individuals. And Victory and some of her family, they're actually going to sell the property and they're going to move into an apartment in Frederick, Maryland. I will jump ahead a little bit in the history of the property. We'll jump to the 1850s. That is when David Best is going to uh, is going to start renting, or I should say, leasing out this property, the farm. Uh, Bess had good relations with the current property owner. He had been working elements of the old La Hermitage going back to the 1840s. So he entered a lease agreement for the southern half of the La Hermitage. So the La Hermitage was divided up and about 200 acres on the southern half will become what is known by Civil War historians as the Bess Farm. And that is what's now preserved by the National Park Service. David Best lived with his wife, Emily, um, my apologies, not Emily, I want to say it was Anna Lentz. Why did I want to say Emily? I don't know. Anna is uh, going to be David's wife, and the married couple will have three children here at the Best Farm. Uh, one of the sons, John Best, and his wife, Margaret, they're going to take over daily operations of the site beginning in 1863, right in the midst of the American Civil War. We got some nifty waysides here to go in more in depth about the storied past of the best property. But the one I want to show is actually contributed by Civil War Trails. Uh, they promote themselves as being the largest outdoor museum relating to the American Civil War with signage all across the United States of America. Any location that has a brush with the American Civil War, they want to document it. So definitely highly recommend you see a Civil War Trails sign on your travels. 
pull over and read the wayside. It'll just be a minute or two, but you're going to learn something you never know before about our shared past. But I want to draw your attention to this wayside and more what we're going to talk about. Uh, before, two years before the Battle of Monocacy, the best property laid host to one of the most important events of the American Civil War. It's not a battle, it is somebody losing property by accident. Oh, we've done that before. You ever lost your phone? You ever lost your car keys? Have you ever locked yourself out of your car with the keys inside? I totally never did that before. Anyways, well, uh, Robert E. Lee uh, did something very similar he here on the best farm on September 9th, 1862. So remember, it's late summer 1862, what's happening? Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. The first Confederate invasion of the North is occurring. The Maryland campaign, Robert E. Lee's first time to try to take the Army of North Virginia to northern soil. And key to his plan was to divide the Army of North Virginia up to cover multiple objectives at the same time. Now, this made his army greatly vulnerable to be surrounded and defeated in detail. So, it is very secretive how his army is going to break up. And he is going to issue Special Orders 191. He's going to issue those orders right here when his army makes camp here on the best farm in 1862 on September 9th. Well, on September 13th, just a few days later, the Union Army are hot on the trails of the Confederates. And a soldiers from the Union Regiment, known as the 27th Indiana, they're going to take a break from the hot marching along the Georgetown Pike. Uh, they're just going to rest in the shade of a tree a mile or two north of where we're standing. And they notice there's a rolled up package of cigars. So they decide, oh, you know, we'll enjoy these nice cigars, you know, a nice leisurely break from the chaos of the American Civil War. Well, as they undo the twine, they also find that the, gar the cigars are wrapped around a piece of paper. And it has the signature of Robert E. Lee on it. It's Special Order 191, a copy that had been dropped by the couriers. So, these 27th Indiana soldiers are going to send it to their uh, regimental commander, who's going to run it up for the brigade commander, up for division headquarters, and up to corps headquarters, before it finally ends up in the possession of the commander of the Army of Potomac at the time, George B. McClellan. And McClellan realizes he knows everywhere Lee is about to be in the next couple of days. And this is going to set the stage for the Battle of Antietam that transpires September 17, 1862, a few miles west of Frederick, uh, in Sharpsburg, Maryland, to be exact. So the bloodiest day in American history, the course for our country to endure its darkest day, was set by a chain of events right here on the Best Far. <laughs> Now, on the morning of July 9th, 1864, where the best hid, it's not actually recorded. Uh, some suspect that, like other families on the battlefield, they hid in their basements. There's really no real recordings where they were. In any case, as we mentioned earlier, Stephen Ramser's division is going to come out of Frederick, coming to the south. He's coming down the Georgetown Pike, which is right out there where you can see the cars running. Well, at least that's the vestiges of it. And they're going to start encountering Union skirmishers. Uh, the division's going to deploy, and they're going to have a tough fight trying to push this small but bitter enemy across Best Farm. And as the Confederates inch more and more ground, they're going to start pushing their artillery pieces into position. And eventually, the Best Farm is going to make a very good platform for Confederate artillery. Uh, the Confederates had approximately 40 pieces of artillery with the Army of the Valley. However, I think less than half of them were actually deployed during the fight here on July 9th. In any case, Best Farm, especially up here by the homestead, makes for a very good artillery platform to fire into the front of this comparatively thin Union line. But in addition to the Union getting last minute reinforcements, the 3rd Division of the 6th Corps coming up here under the cover of darkness, uh, they're also going to have the terrain at their advantage. Uh, you'll notice, if you look really close, you can actually see railroad tracks. There would have been a rail line there in 1864. This is, of course, Monocacy Junction for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. This particular branch actually runs over to Harper's Ferry, then Virginia, later West Virginia. And, well, you can uh, go. We have a whole bunch of Harper's Ferry videos to so learn more about what happens on the other end of these tracks. 
In any case, this railroad cut is going to be used as a bit of a trench by the skirmishers trying to delay Ramsher's division from taking the north side to the Monocacy River. So, not only did you have a major battle happen here on this property, you also had one of the most important, this course was set for America's bloodiest day on this property. I think the best family bit off more than anybody else could chew, especially the mid-19th century when relating to the American Civil War. And did they get compensation for all that happened on their property? Because you know, these armies passing over in 1862, 63, 64, there was some serious damage. Well, actually, yes, it took some time, but John Best would receive uh, damage uh, re compensation from the federal government, about $1,200 worth he will receive. All that relating to the 1862 encampment that was here by the Union Army. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, the Best family, man, they, they bit off more than the average person could chew in American history. With Ramsher's division stalled north of the Georgetown Pike Bridge and other Confederate forces being stalled along the Jug Bridge, which carried the National Road east from Frederick to Baltimore, Early, who's been spending the morning of July 9th trying to ransom the town of Frederick of $200,000, no less, uh, he's going to get reports that things are not going according to plan. And as cankerous as always, is going to ride out here, I'm sure, grumbling, well, how, how can you not handle this situation so smoothly? So he's going to get out here to the Monoxy battlefield. And when I say here, I'm talking more about at the best farm. And he realizes I'm not getting across the Georgetown Pike directly. I'm gonna have to find an alternate way around the left of the Union line, wherever that left flank may end. So, a little bit about Early. Uh, he doesn't really have a high appeal of cavalry. Uh, he calls them buttermilk rangers. He thinks that they are too independent for their own good, that they're more ru they're ruffians that just run off and they, they wear the uniform, but they don't act like soldiers. They go off and just reign holy terror and really don't do anything for military strategy. So, what's going to happen is he's going to have to trust this part of the army, which he does normally like entrusting situations to, and he's going to send John McClausland's brigade of Confederate cavalry to try to find a way across the Monoxy River and get behind the Union line. And, well, McClausland is going to do just that. Uh, he is going to find a ford uh, just down below me over here, uh, what's known as Warmington Ford, and there is some some brief action down there. There is some, I want to say it was Illinois cavalry. I could be mistaken on the state, but they were Union cavalry. They're quickly driven out of the Ford. McClausland is going to ride up onto this hilltop where there's this lovely farmhouse of the Warvington family. And he's going to get a pretty good view of what's in front of him. Now, you have to understand that the situation has changed 160 years since the battle. There is a tree line over here. Uh, that tree line is intentionally there, left by the National Park Service, to mask an interstate that cuts right through the battlefield. Use your imagination that around that interstate, around that tree line, there was a fence line dividing the farm of the Warvingtons and the farm of the Thomases. And just beyond that fence line, McClausland, from this position, can see Union soldiers. So he suspects he has found the Union left, and he suspects it's only guarded by 100 Days men. He is right, he has found the Union left. Those are not 100 Days men. Now, the Worthington property really didn't have that name. Uh, it only recently been called the Worthington Farm in 1862 when John Worthington took possession of this farmland and moved in here with his wife and his three sons and had several enslaved individuals working this farm. Now, the morning of the, day, the, morning of the battle, I should say, but the morning of the day of the attack, that is just a run-on sentence. The morning of the battle, early morning, Warvington knows a big fight is imminent and very likely is going to occur on his grounds. So he is going to have his enslaved people start rounding up all the livestock, uh, start harvesting all the crops prematurely to throw them into storage in the basement and barns and whatever they can't save here on the house. They're going to take with the livestock and several of the enslaved individuals take all of those goods, all that livestock to Sugarloaf Mountain and try to hide it from the Confederates. Spoiler alert. That did not work. Uh, Confederate forces will find uh, Worthington's uh, livestock, 
his crops and his enslaved individuals up in Sugarloaf Mountain later in the day and confiscate all of those valuable goods in Worthington. Now, meanwhile, as that's going on, uh, John Worthington, uh, his family, the family of the Monoxy Junction manager, and uh, several of the enslaved individuals are all going to seek shelter down here in the basement of the Worthington house. Just around the time that McClausland and his cavalry right up here, McClausland, you can imagine, pulling his binoculars out, looking beyond the horizon, seeing that fence line, seeing 100 days men, he thinks, and he's going to decide to dismount his men and make a charge. And well, in the basement over here of the Worthington house, uh, you may notice that one of the windows were boarded up, and that is intentional, because through those boarded windows, a six-year-old Glenn Worthington vividly recalls seeing McClausland's first assault down from his family farm toward, his toward the neighbor's farm. It did not go well for the Confederates. What ended up happening was they ran into not 100 Days men that were going to run away immediately. Instead, they had run into the 3rd Division of the 6th Corps, commanded by General James Ricketts. And well, they're in for a hard time because Ricketts' division had just endured the Overland Campaign, the bloodiest military operation the Union conducted during the American Civil War. Uh, they had gone through the meat grinder and had, they had gone from being boys to being men. That's the polite way of putting it. And they had just been brought out of the trenches of Petersburg, Virginia, just a few days before the fight in here at Monacacy, when the United States government realized how urgent the matter was around the D.C. area. So Grant would give uh, the D.C. defenses some regular soldiers to bolster their defenses, and they're going to arrive no sooner. I think they arrive under the cover of darkness, July 8th, going into July 9th, here on the Monocacy battle line. And, well, they're going to be very important in delaying uh, Early's approach to Washington, D.C. So McClausland's dismounted cavalry go right into the muzzles of these regular soldiers. You can imagine the nasty scene that's going to occur in the valley below us. McClausland's men are going to quickly call off the fight and fall back up here to the Worthington farm. And throughout the rest of the battle, there is going to be a field hospital just over here. Glenn Worthington, in his account of the battle, he would recall that a field hospital was erected by the Confederates just rear of the family house. Uh, the Confederates using the reverse slope to shield themselves from the six core guys. They've quickly realized they're not facing off again, 100 days, men. And throughout midday, uh, there's going to be a lot of people coalescing around this side of the hill, licking their wounds. And they're trying to figure out how, they're reassessing the situation, essentially. So around midday, there is going to be a lull on the Monoxy battlefield. As the Confederates realize they're in for one hell of a fight and have to figure out how to go about not fighting hundreds days men, but fighting regular soldiers from the Army of the Potomac. It was also here a few days after the battle that Glenn Worthington's most vivid memory of the fighting occurs. It's not actually about the fight on July 9th, but rather the aftermath. Uh, he recalls a fire pit full of muskets, presumably muskets that were either captured or were busted up, and the Confederates had no use for them anymore. And they were in this fire pit somewhere around here on the rear side of the house. And, well, young Glenn, he saw a bayonet in the fire, and he wanted a souvenir badly. So he's going to go down there for a stick, and he's trying to pull the bayonet out of the fire. Well, he gets a little too close to that fire because in amongst the flames were some unused cartridges and... The gunpowder in one of them cartridges went off and temporarily blinded the poor young lad. Uh, he would recover his eyesight, but he will never forget that moment here on the Monocacy battlefield. So over my shoulder, you're going to notice a truss bridge. That was not there in 1864. There's a reason why it was not there in 1864. Uh, initially, that was roughly where the covered bridge that carried the Georgetown Pike over the Monocacy River was located. And that covered bridge is key to General Wallace's strategy to try to blunt Early's advance on Washington, D.C. Now, initially, Wallace only had 3,500 Union soldiers to guard the whole length of the Monocacy River. Uh, he is going to get reinforcements on the eve of the battle. He's going to get a few more thousand soldiers from Ricketts' 3rd Division of the Union 6th Corps. Those are regular soldiers, but still, that's only 6,000 men to face off against what 
Wallace is being told is going to be 15,000 Confederate soldiers. So he's got a great numerical disadvantage. How can Wallace deter the Confederates from advancing on DC with such few men? Choke points. These crossings are critical, but it's also they're choke points. You're going to take so many troops or so many wagons over these crossings at a given point in time. So he's going to center his defense on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Bridge, which is just a was a few feet this direction, an Iron Railroad Bridge. There's a modern replacement over in that direction. And then you're going to have also the Georgetown Pike Bridge behind me and another bridge that nobody talks about with the Battle of Monocacy, the Jug Bridge, which carries the National Road out of Frederick going east toward Baltimore. So that's about a mile or two upstream over my shoulder. And I got another bug in my eye. Not the first time this has happened and will not be the last that happens today in this edition of Retracing History. So he is going, he doesn't have to have too many soldiers at these spots because they're choke points. Uh, trying to get the Confederate divisions to go from battle lines back in the columns across, it's gonna be quite difficult. And the assign, uh, initially, uh, there you're gonna have some of your 100 days men of uh, the, uh, defending around here, but with the Sixth Corps arriving, you're gonna have skirmishers of the 10th Vermont, 9th New York Heavy Artillery, and a few other skirmishers from the Sixth Corps are gonna reinforce those 100 days men right here uh, in front of the covered bridge. Now, technically, I'm on the north side of the bridge. I'm walking on the property of the Best Farm, and we've already talked about Stephen Ramsher deploying his Confederate division on the Best Farm, uh, thinking he's just gonna chase off these Union soldiers and take the bridge, meet stiff resistance. While it's a numerically small resistance, it is still stiff because these are regular soldiers fresh out of the trenches of Petersburg. They know how to fight, this is what I'm trying to say. And eventually, charge of the bridge is going to fall to First Lieutenant George Davis of the 10th Vermont. Now, he wasn't initially supposed to have command of the bridge defense. Uh, it was supposed to be somebody with the 100 Days men. But as soon as Davis and the Vermonters show up, uh, this officer who's in charge of the bridge looks like, Hey, Davis, you know what you're doing. You're in charge. And Lieutenant Davis is like, Okay. <laughs> And, well, Davis will put up a fierce defense of the bridge. Uh, he is going to stall Ramsher's advance across Best Farm throughout the morning. But, eventually, the numerical advantage of the Confederates is overwhelming Davis and his small force defending not just the Georgetown Pike, but also defending the Iron Railroad Bridge. And around midday, Wallace is going to tell the men out here, get across the Pike, get across the Monoxy River, get on the south side on the Thomas Farm, we're burning the bridge. Now, the man who's in charge of this is going to be a 18-year-old uh, 18-year-old boy in the 9th New York Artillery. His name is Alfred Sova, and Sova, along with two other men from the 9th New York Heavy Artillery, uh, they had already been under the guidance of Davis, I presume. They were already putting uh, wheat up in the rafters, sheaves of wheat in the rafters of the covered bridge, anticipating that they're going to have to burn it. When Wallace gives the command, they're going to go out there and they're going to light those sheaves and they're going to get the heck out of Dodge. And it doesn't take too long before on this hot sweltering day that the Georgetown Pike Bridge catches a flame and burns down to the abutments. The Confederate Army are not going to have an easy route to Washington, D.C. But there's plenty more fighting that is going to happen. Now the fighting is going to shift from here at Monoxy Junction itself. It's going to shift over to the, uh, the Union left flank on the Warmington and Thomas Farm. Arms. But before we finish up here talking about the defense of the covered bridge, I want to mention that Davis, who was thrusted into action, did the best he could to delay Ramsher's division uh, for his heroics out here on the best farm and defending this bridge. He is going to receive the Medal of Honor in 1892 for his actions. All right, we've made our way to the east from the Worthington Farm across the modern interstate den, the fence line between the Worthington and Thomas families. And we're standing right in front of the Thomas residents here on their farm. Now, Christian Frederick Thomas moved to this farmland in 1860 on the eve of the American Civil War because he wanted to get away from the political tensions mounting in the city of Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, the presidential election is just wrapping up. Lincoln has been elected president. And 
uh, Thomas realizes there's going to be some serious conflict, and he suspects it's going to occur predominantly in the cities around D.C., Richmond, and Baltimore. He thinks if he moves his family, which includes of his wife, Evelyn, his son, Samuel, and her, his two daughters, if he moves them to the countryside around Frederick, he will be safe from whatever violence ensues. Unfortunately, by doing so, he had placed himself right on the crossroads of the American Civil War. As Frederick, Maryland, due to its rail juncture here, the Monoxy Railroad Juncture, the National Road, and the, the Georgetown Pike all intersecting here, both Union and Confederate forces will pass through here throughout the conflict, not just the fighting here on July 9th, 1864. Now, Interestingly enough, while it's expected that the Thomases had some Southern sympathies, they are going to be quite friendly with the Union garrison that is stationed out here throughout late 1862 and 1863, guarding the Monaxi Rail Junction. Amongst those garrison was the 14th New Jersey Infantry Regiment, and they're actually going to, several of them are going to dine with the Thomases on regular occasions, uh, be host to parties that the Thomas are having here at their farm. And the two sides come to know each other quite well, which is going to add a intimate twist to the Thomas family when their farm becomes the scene of the heaviest fighting in the Battle of Monocacy. Now, on July 5th, 1864, uh, the Thomases are trying to enjoy the best of life during the Civil War. They're trying to keep all the negative news coming out of Virginia and elsewhere, keeping it in the back of the mind, because they're anticipating a marriage. In fact, they're anticipating two marriages, uh, one directly with the family, another a family friend that's getting married. And, well, they decide on July 5th they're going to have a nice, you know, nice drinking a uh, nice drink out here. They're going to sit back and enjoy the weather of Maryland on the veranda of the Thomas property. Uh, amongst the people that are up here is Samuel Thomas, of course, Mr. Thomas's son. Uh, you're also going to have Thomas's daughter, Alice, up here and a couple other family friends of uh, Samuel and Alice. And well, Union soldiers are going to start running up this driveway uh, well, I guess, you know, Lane, you know, you get the point. Uh, they're going to run up here up to the veranda and they're going to see these fr uh, free young gentlemen, including Samuel, who are in plain clothes and they're not serving in the military, which is a bit bewildering because of what we're in 1864. The draft's in effect, you know, just about everybody, every able-bodied young man is involved in the conflict in some capacity. Well, they suspect that Samuel and his two friends are spies and they apprehend them. And when they take them back to the army, they figure out, okay, they're not spies, but we're gonna use you as manual labor. And they're gonna impress them into one of the Maryland regiments who are working to shore up the defenses around the Monocacy Junction. So here you have Samuel Thomas, uh, you're gonna have Julius Anderson, who's actually the fiance of Alice Thomas. And there's gonna be one other male friend of theirs. They're all impressed into service right here on the Thomas property. Well. On the morning of July 9th, right as the battle's about to kick off, a Union officer notices that Thomas and his friends, who are in the Union battle line, they really don't have Union dress on. They're still in their civilian dress. And now we're in a situation that if the Confederates capture Samuel and his two friends, they may be considered spies and tried and executed. So the Union officer takes pity on them and tells them that they can go back and seek shelter for the battle. So they don't actually take part in the major fighting. And well, we'll talk a little bit about where Samuel, Julius, and their friend take shelter later on. Uh, but rest assured, all three do survive and are proclaimed by the local population as the heroes of monocacy. After the war, uh, Alice and Julius do get married. It's a little bit later than they anticipated, and it's actually gonna happen right here on the Thomas property. Their marriage will be hosted. While by no means is this exact, uh, this farm lane gives you a rough parallel of how the Union battle line would have formed up on the Thomas property on July 9th, 1864. And just give you a juxtaposition, there is actually the Thomas house itself. Now, most of Ricketts' division are going to start pivoting toward the west, 
when McClauslin starts appearing with his Confederate cavalry on the Worthington farm, which I'm pointing to, which is right through that trees, right across the interstate. You have to use your imagination. It's right over there. Uh, Truex's brigade, which is the left side of this Union division, are going to be the ones predominantly surrounding the Thomas structure, so the barns of the house itself. They're the ones actually guarding this property. Uh, on the left flank of Truex's brigade, you're going to have the 10th Vermont, minus their skirmishers who are still guarding the junction. Then you're going to have on the right end of Truex's brigade, you're going to have the 14th New Jersey. Ah, there comes that tie again. The 14th New Jersey, the Monocacy Regiment. Uh, these guys were stationed here for a better part of a year. Uh, they knew the Thomas family well, and now they are defending the Thomas family from Confederate hands. And Around 11 o'clock, McClaudson's going to make his first attack on the Thomas farm. We've already talked about this. He thought that the Sixth Corps were 100 days men. Turns out he is absolutely wrong. Uh, the soldiers here, such as the 14th New Jersey and the 10th Vermont, they're going to hold their fire to the last possible moment. They're well disciplined. They're volleys. They tear apart McClaudson's men. Uh, one of McClaudson's regiments, their commander, their regimental commander, will be mortally wounded out here. Then there's a lull. And that's going to allow Rickett uh, to report to General Wallace himself about, hey, we got a massive Confederate presence building on our left flank. Ricketts is going to start pivoting the whole division to face toward the Worthington farm. And at 2 o'clock, McClausen's going to make another attack. Now, McClausen's learned some lessons. He's learned 100 days, men. He's not going to make a frontal assault. He's going to try to outflank them. And he's going to move through a low ground over here. And he's going to come up around the rear of the 10th Vermont, and he's actually going to be able to outflank to, uh, Ricketts' division. And Truex's brigade are going to start having to fall back. And for a brief period of time, McClausland's Confederate dismounted cavalry actually take possession of the Thomas farm right around this area. There is brief, vicious hand to hand fighting that's going to ensue. But 10th Vermont, 14th New Jersey, the rest of Turex's brigade and the whole division are going to rally to the east of the property. They're going to launch a vicious counterattack back over this hilltop, drive McClausland's now exhausted dismounted cavalry back down into this depression and back toward the Worthington farm. At 3.30, Jubal Early has had enough. He expected to cross the Monocacy River without much resistance and be at Washington, D.C. by the end of the day, at the very least at the next day. He is going to throw the best division he got toward Ricketts Division up here in the Thomas Farm. And that is going to be John B. Gordon's division. And ah, yes, John B. Gordon. He's a regular, he's the main character of Readout Productions, Retracing History, I feel. Uh, we've talked about him at Barlow's Noah at Gettysburg. We, of course, talked about how he survived five wounds at the Battle of Antietam in 1862. And now here he is in divisional command. Uh, he's in charge of some Virginians, but predominantly Georgians and Louisianians. And, well, he's going to start at the Worthington Farm. He's going to advance to the east. He's coming down between the valley, between the two farms. And he's going to assault up this direction towards Ricketts Union Division, including the 14th New Jersey and the 10th Vermont up here. This is the third attack that r most of Ricketts' division has endured today, especially Truex's brigade that the 14th and 10th are a part of. It's now 90 plus degrees outside. It's 3.30 in the afternoon. These guys are baking. They're starting to run low on ammunition. And now you got a full Confederate infantry division coming towards you. They're going to try their best to hold the ground. They're very stubborn to give up the Thomas Farm, the 14th New Jersey, especially due to the sentimental ties to these grounds. But Gordon's division, they're going to come up here, press themselves right up to the faces of Ricketts division. There is a brief but intense firefight. You can just imagine the smoke. You probably wouldn't really be able to see too far over toward the farmhouse as these two divisions collide in a titanic clash for the control over the Monoxy Junction. And well, Gordon wins this fight. Ricketts division is too badly mauled by this point in the day and they're going to start giving ground, falling back toward the east, toward the Georgetown Pike. And eventually, by 5 o'clock in the evening, Lou Wallace realizes it's inevitable that the Confederates are going to cross the Monocacy River here south of Frederick. But hey, a job well done. They have delayed Jubal early a full day. Now it's time to get out of Dodge and save as many people as possible from capture. As the 10th Vermont and the rest of Ricketts 
third division, the sixth corps, fall back across the Thomas Farm, across the Georgetown Pike, trying to head toward the National Road to get to Baltimore in time. Uh, there's gonna be a Medal of Honor moment. Uh, you're gonna have Corporal Alexander Scott, who interestingly enough was actually born in Montreal. Uh, he is one of the flag bearers at 10 Vermont here during the Battle of Monocacy. And he's actually carrying the state flag for this regiment. And while as the retreat is ongoing, uh, the bearer of the national flag drops over, not from a wound, just from the exhaustion, from the heat of the day, from the fatigue of trying to endure numerous Confederate attacks, this national color bearer just couldn't take it anymore and just dropped from exhaustion. So Alexander Scott's gonna rush in, grab the national flag, and he's gonna carry both the state and national colors of the 10th Vermont off the battlefield and keep them from being captured by the Confederates. As I mentioned, for this, uh, Alexander Scott will eventually be awarded the Medal of Honor in 1897 for this action here at Monocacy. Interestingly enough, uh, he is in Company D of the 10th Vermont, the same company that George Davis was in. So Company D is going to be awarded, in fact, two Medal of Honors from their fighting here at the Battle of Monocacy. All right, we've moved from the Thomas Farm, we've moved east of the historic Georgetown Pike, and we're now standing on the property that would have contained the Gambrel Mill. Uh, the stone structure you see behind me is the vestiges of that mill. It was actually three stories tall at the time of the battle, had been constructed in the 1830s, and James A. Gambrel took over the property in 1855. Uh, he's actually going to have two sets of milling stones, so he's able to produce quite a lot of flour for a number of merchants that are coming in uh, who, that need their flour milled down to be taken to market. So a lot of the properties we've been talking about today on this edition of Retrace in History, the Thomases, the Worthingtons, the Bass, all three of them very likely had come to Mr. Gambrill sometime before Turin and after the American Civil War to have their flour milled down either for personal use or so it could be taken off to market on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, which again, it's junctions right just north of where I'm pointing. <laughs> so, you know, all comes to, it all is coming together. It's all coming together. Let's play the Kronk meme. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Now, uh, this mill could produce 60 barrels of flour a day. So valuable assets south of Frederick, Maryland. It is also a very sturdy structure, as you can see. Sturdy enough that it could be suitable to shield people who are injured or in harm's way. And indeed, this will be used as a Union field hospital at the onset of the Battle of Monocacy. We're just behind the Union right flank around the Monocacy Junction area. So just a few hundred yards back from the railroad and the road bridge, you could bring your wounded over here and you're pretty well sheltered at the start of the battle. It's also here or in this immediate vicinity where Samuel Thomas Julius Anderson, after they have been relieved of their duties, as temporary Union soldiers trying to shore up the defenses around the junction. Uh, they're going to fall back to Gambrel's Mill. They're not able to get to the Thomas family in time when the battle begins, so they seek shelter here at Gambrel's Mill during the fighting. And around 5 o'clock, when General Wallace orders the entire army to retreat toward Baltimore, the left flank of the Union line, that being Ricketts Division, they're going to pass right through where we're standing, right through these grounds. So this would have been a scene of chaos and confusion as they're trying to grab as many of the wounded as they can to get them out of the reach of the Confederates, evacuate over rough topography to try to get to the National Pike through the road to Baltimore. All told, Wallace's ad hoc Union defense along the Monocacy River suffered 1,300 casualties. While losing the battlefield was inevitable, they had succeeded in inflicting 900 casualties amongst Early's Confederate forces that day. While Early had achieved his biggest victory of the war, he had no time to celebrate. The Army of the Valley was just as fatigued as their Union counterpart, tuning to bivouac near Frederick that night rather than continue on to D.C. The Battle of Monocacy would cost Early a full day in his march on the Union capital. While that may seem small, it was just the window of time needed to move reinforcements into the capital city's defenses. On July 11th, Early made his forlorn attack on Fort Stevens, with President Lincoln personally witnessing the fighting. But after two days of sparring, the Confederates made no serious assault. Facing supply shortages, as well as an ever-shrinking army trying to achieve all of Richmond's wishes, Early began to withdraw from Maryland. 
Any criticism against Wallace for losing the battlefield on July 9th quickly evaporated with Early's retreat. Given the Battle of Monocacy the lofty distinction as the battle that saved the nation's capital. Now, by no means is the fighting here in Maryland and Northern Virginia over. Jubal Early's Army of the Valley are still operating in the Shenandoah Valley. And throughout July and August of 1864, they're going to be sparring with Union forces at the lower end of the valley. However, what's going to happen is... This is Grant. He's going to take a break from the siege of Petersburg. He's going to come up to Frederick, Maryland. He's actually going to host a meeting on the Thomas Farm with David Hunter and Philip Sheridan. And he's also going to plan out what we know as Sheridan's Valley Campaign, which will occur in the fall of 1864. Mr. Sheridan is going to lead a Union army out of Harper's Ferry. They're going to move into the Shenandoah Valley. And before the end of 1864, the breadbasket of the Confederacy is now in the possession of the Union Army, and that will remain a fact through the rest of the American Civil War. Now, the Battle of Monocacy fell a bit into obscurity in the American history books. Most focus is given to Robert E. Lee's second invasion of the North, which culminates in the Battle of Gettysburg, and supporting that myth that Gettysburg is the one and only turning point of the American Civil War. I think if you followed us here at Readout Productions or in any number of history channels here on YouTube, maybe Project Past, uh, History Underground, uh, History Savior 1941, the American Battlefield Trust, you've learned very quickly that no, that's not the case. However, people are going to still remember Monocacy. And while there ain't many, there are five monuments dedicated on the Monocacy battlefield. Uh, to my knowledge, at least three of them are relating exclusively to Union regiments that served here. Uh, unfortunately, I'm running out of time for this edition of Retracing History. I only have time to pay my respects to one, but I have picked the monument to the Monocacy Regiment to pay my respects to. Now, we've been touching on the 14th New Jersey in passing, and I'm sure you've discovered by this point, they have quite the tie to this particular battlefield. Uh, the 14th New Jersey were raised in the summer of 1862, and they actually conducted their initial drills on the old Monmouth Courthouse battlefield. That was a Revolutionary War battlefield where George Washington's Connell Army were able to hold their ground against British forces in the summer of 1778. Less than a century later, you have a new crop of soldiers going off to fight for the United States of America. Uh, they did not really see a lot of combat until 1864. Uh, their first major in involvement with the war was garrisoning the fences along the Monocacy River, believe it or not. And in fact, this particular regiment was stationed at Monocacy Junction, which is right over there, basically where the bridge is. So they spent the fall of 1862 throughout the early half of 1863 garrisoning this vital rail juncture, using their lives to protect it against any potential Confederate threat. And in reality, most people did not anticipate a major Confederate threat would come here. What they were really expecting was more uh, small cavalry raids, such as Mosby's Rangers coming out of the Shenandoah Valley and causing havoc on the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Nobody ever thought a a full massive Confederate army would get this close to Washington, D.C. Well, in 1862, Lee tried, he failed. In 1863, he tries again, he fails. In 1864, Jubal Early is going to do what Robert E. Lee himself did not do and get to the gates of Washington, D.C. And that is going to bring Ricketts Division of the Sixth Corps. Yes, I'm sure you've heard that name all day during this video. He is that important to this battlefield. Ricketts Division of the Sixth Corps come here to defend Monocacy Junction, to reinforce Wallace, to give him a fighting chance in delaying Early's assault on Washington, D.C. And one of the regiments in that division was the 14th New Jersey. So essentially it was a homecoming for this regiment. And they're going to take part in some of the heavy fighting that happens over on the Thomas Farm later in the day on July 9th, 1864. And they're going to defend their adopted home with their lives. The 14th New Jersey will lose five regimental commanders killed, wounded, or missing at the end of this day. Four of their color guard are going to be killed. Uh, in total, they suffer 40% casualties on the Monocacy battlefield, one of the highest casualty rates suffered by a Union regiment here in the defense of the Monocacy Junction. 
for their ties to the Monocacy Junction, both in their defense and later in the fighting here on July 9th, many people began calling nickname in the 14th New Jersey as the Monocacy Regiment. And the name has stuck through the record books to this very day. And where else would the 14th New Jersey put their monument where they had their stamp on history than right here at Monocacy Junction? The monument was dedicated by about 100 veterans of the New Jersey, uh, 14th New Jersey in 1907. And since then, it's been rededicated in 1964 for the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Monocacy, and then in 2007 for the 100th anniversary of this particular monument's dedication. Of particular note is the seven-foot statue of a Union soldier in the 14th New Jersey. Uh, you'll, the veterans wanted people to notice his uniform. It is not in what they call parade dress. Rather, he is in a fatigue blouse. Uh, he has his McDowell cap propped open. The brim of the cap is propped up. Kind of looks like the man is exhausted as his buttons are coming undone. They wanted the soldier on top of their monument not to represent somebody in a nice dress parade, but somebody on the battlefield and working hard to protect this country. Thank you folks for tuning in to this edition of Retracing History where we got to explore the site of the Union defeat that saved Washington DC and how the sacrifices made by people such as those in the 14th New Jersey ensured the Union victory over the Confederacy in the American Civil War. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the like button down below. Be sure to subscribe here to the channel to be the first notified when a new edition of Retrace in History or another video comes out from this channel. And if you want to go the extra mile supporting me, you can go to our Ko-fi page. Link is in the description below where you can buy me a cup of coffee. It helps wake me up early in the morning to get out here to have enough time to explore these hallowed grounds such as those here at Monocacy National Battlefield. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.